Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Ian Askew. I'm the director of the Reproductive Health and Research Program here at WHO. And uh, it's nice to have you here with us uh, for this um, webinar uh, about the WHO recommendations on the use of contraceptive methods by women at high risk of HIV. Um, as I think you're aware, we have a, a one hour session um, with two main presentations and then an opportunity uh, for, for questions if, if you have some. Um, please bear in mind um, that uh, the, guide, the guideline itself will be launched um, by WHO tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon uh, Geneva time. And so the information that uh, we're sharing with you today is embargoed into that time. And so we do ask you to respect that embargo period. Um, the session uh, will be recorded, and so uh, you'll be able to access the recording and share it with us, others if you like to. Um, but we'll make the recording available, obviously, after the launch tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Um, because of the nature of the webinar and the number of people online, we'd ask that if you do have any questions, you can submit them at any time. Um, but please do so uh, using the uh, box on the right hand screen of the right hand part of the screen to send the question in writing and then we can compile them and uh, organize uh, responses for those questions for the, uh, the presenters at the end of the session. Um, I think I'd also like to just uh, conclude my welcome to everyone um, by acknowledging that uh, this webinar is being organized by the Implementing Best Practices Consortium which we, uh, we're, we're part of and we're very grateful to them for, for bringing this together um, and uh, helping us to, to make sure that this works uh, for everyone. So with that, I'd just like to move across now to the first of the two presentations. Uh, the two presentations today, the first one will be by uh, Mary Lynn Gaffield, um, who's a colleague of mine here in the department, uh, who is our um, guideline specialist and has been uh, responsible for taking this process um, right the way through. And then the second um, presentation after Mary Lynn will be by James, James Chiari, who's the coordinator for family planning um, and other uh, SRH issues here at, uh, here at the department. And James will talk a bit more about um, the implementation of the, of the guideline and uh, what, uh, what's, uh, what the plans are for moving forward with both sharing it more widely and also helping to support countries to adapt the, 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 uh, the recommendations. So with that, I'll hand over now to Mary Lynn and um, look forward to her presentation about the guideline process and the, the key recommendations that the Guideline Development Group reached. So Mary Lynn, over to you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the Implementing Best Practices Consortium for facilitating this webinar. We're really delighted to share this with all of you. So before I begin, I'd also like to thank the members of the Guideline Development Group and the External Review Group for their contributions, which shaped this revised guidance on contraceptive eligibility for women at high risk of HIV. And we also extend our gratitude to Drs. Philip Hannaford and Natasha Kooma, who chaired the Guideline Development Group meeting. Next slide, please. For nearly 25 years, WHO's Department of Reproductive Health and Research has produced the Medical Eligibility Criteria for Contraceptive Use, or MEC. On the 1st of June, 2015, WHO issued the fifth edition of the MEC. The MEC is an evidence-based guideline that provides more than 2,000 recommendations on the safety of 25 contraceptive methods for women with certain medical conditions or personal characteristics. And in particular, this guideline includes recommendations on contraceptive eligibility for women at high risk of HIV infection. Next slide, please. Now, although many of you are already familiar with the format of the MEC recommendations, I'd like to take a moment to briefly review the meaning of the four category scale that's used to indicate eligibility. Category one indicates a medical condition or characteristic 
that for, for which there is no re restrictions on the use of the method. Conditions classified as category two indicate that the method can generally be used, but careful follow-up may be required. Category three conditions are those that require careful clinical judgment and access to clinical services. And category four conditions are those that present an unacceptable health risk and the method in question should not be used. Now, in certain situations, separate recommendations will be made if eligibility differs according to whether the woman is initiating or continuing to use the method. In settings where resources for clinical judgment are limited, please click again. The four category scale can be simplified into two categories. Thus, women with a condition classified as category one or two can use the contraceptive method, whereas if she has a category three or four condition, she shouldn't use the method. Next slide, please. In cases where the number itself, meaning the, the, cat of the four categories that I just described, does not adequately communicate the essence of the recommendation, a clarification is included. And the clarification accompanies the numerical recommendation and appears in the right-hand column in the larger MEC document. And the clarification is also the responsibility of the guideline development group to craft. Next slide, please. Following the release of the fifth edition of the MEC in 2015, WHO became aware of new data on the safety of hormonal contraception for women at high risk of HIV acquisition. An updated, of the, an updated systematic review supporting the fifth edition's recommendations was commissioned. And due to the findings in the review, WHO issued updated guidance in March 2017. Next slide, please. The 2017 guidance recommended that the injectables, DMPA, intermuscular or subcutaneous, and northeastern enanthate should be changed to a category two. Implants and progestogen-only pills remained as a category one. Please click. Additionally, click again, please. A new clarification was issued. And in essence, this clarification reminded users of this guideline that uncertainty remained as to whether there was an, the injectable contraceptives increased or not the risk of HIV acquisition. However, in many settings, unintended pregnancies or pregnancy-related morbidity and mortality are, remained common and progestogen-only injectables were among the few methods widely available. So it was the imperative that women should be not denied the use of progestogen-only uh, injectables because of concerns about the possible increased risks. However, women considering the use of the, these methods should be advised about the possible increased risk and about the uncertainty about whether the association was causal. And they should also be um, informed about how to minimize their risk of acquiring HIV. And in addition, the evidence statement was updated showing that although the evidence from 13 observational studies of DMPA net N or nonspecific progestogen only injectables was considered to be informative, but with important limitations, the data from these studies continued to show some association between the use of these methods and the risk of HIV acquisition, but it remained unclear as to whether the results indicated a causal relationship or were due to methodological limitations. Next slide. In the 2017 guidance, the recommendations for other contraceptive methods, such as combined methods and IUDs, did not chain, and they remained the same as they appear in the 2015 um, MEC document. Next slide, please. In the 2017 guidance, WHO 
reaffirmed its commitment to monitor and assess any new evidence relevant to contraceptive safety. New information, including results from a large multinational randomized clinical trial, led WHO to undertake a review of all the available evidence and assess whether another revision of the MEC guidance was needed. This review followed the standards and requirements specified in WHO's handbook for guideline development. This process ensures that WHO guidelines are of the highest quality and follow a transparent and systematic process. Next slide, please. To guide the process, the meeting included several background presentations, summaries of the epidemiological evidence, presentations on values and preferences of contraceptive users, and a review of the biological evidence. I will give more detail on these elements in the following slides. Next slide. As mentioned previously, the meeting started with a brief review of the current or 2017 WHO recommendations, which is followed by two presentations on country experiences actually implementing these recommendations. These were then followed by a review of the ECHO study primary results, which were published on the 13th of June of this year, as well as two systematic reviews of the epidemiological evidence on contraceptive use among women at high risk of HIV and copper-bearing IUD use among women at high risk of HIV. The quality of this evidence was presented applying the great approach to evidence assessment. Next slide. To consider values and preferences of contraceptive users, findings from a systematic review on users values, preferences, views, and concerns regarding the contraceptive methods in the MEC were shared. Results from a global online survey of sex workers and participatory focus group discussions with female sex workers in Zimbabwe through the Sisters and Voice program were also shown. And in addition, stakeholders representing specific affected populations contributed their critical perspectives. As mentioned earlier, there was also a review of biological data. Next slide. The guideline development group comprised of 28 participants from 19 countries and included experts in family planning and HIV, representatives from affected populations, clinicians, epidemiologists, researchers, program managers, policymakers, and guideline methodologists. The guideline development group, or GDG, was tasked to review the evidence and the grade evidence profiles, formulate recommendations using an evidence to decision framework, which takes into account quality of the evidence, balance between benefits and harms of the intervention, values and preferences of end users or contraceptive users for this uh, particular question, feasibility of implementation and human rights and, and equity. They were also asked to identify any evidence gaps when undertaking this process. And lastly, they were asked to review and approve the final guideline document before it was submitted to WHO's Guidelines Review Committee. Next slide, please. So to start, for combined hormonal contraceptives, meaning pills, the transdermal patch, the combined vaginal ring, and the combined injectable contraceptives, the guideline development group determined that the current MEC recommendations for these methods among women at high risk of HIV should be upheld. These methods, therefore, remain a category one, indicating no restrictions on their use. The evidence statement, however, has been updated slightly to reflect the newly published evidence from the Palini Phillips study this year. Next slide, please. And now I'll discuss the heart of our discussions, progestogen-only contraceptives and interuterine devices. 
Next slide, please. To begin with, the ECHO study was a large randomized controlled co clinical trial conducted in Eswatini, Kenya, South Africa, and Zambia. It was specifically designed to compare HIV incidence among users of three contraceptive methods, intermuscular DMPA, levonorgestrel implants, and copper-bearing IUDs. The trial randomized 7,829 HIV seronegative women between the ages of 16 and 35 who desired effective contraception and consented to be randomized to one of these three methods. There was no group of non-users of contraception in this study because all of the women enrolled desired effective contraception. Women as part of this trial returned every three months for HIV testing, contraceptive counseling, safety monitoring, behavioral assessment, and a comprehensive package of HIV prevention services. And they were followed for up to 18 months. Next slide, please. This slide presents the primary comparisons, which were the main focus of the GDG's deliberations. The GGD, GDG focused on the point estimates indicated by the hazard ratio presented in the ECHO trial. Thus, for DMPA versus non-hormonal contraception, or in the case of ECHO, the copper-bearing IUD, a hazard ratio of 1.04 was given the greatest consideration. This evidence was judged to be of high quality according to grade criteria where limitations inconsistency of the evidence, imprecision of the estimates, indirectness of the evidence are considered. And this was, this was due to the trial's design and its ability to address unmeasured confounding, which was considered to be a major cause of uncertainty with the earlier observational studies. And as indicated with, by the 96% confidence intervals surrounding the hazard ratio for this particular comparison, the um, estimate was not significant. For implants, you can also show these arrows, thank you. For implants, the comparison between non-hormonal contraception, which was um, also taken from the ECHO trial, compared levonorgestrel implants with copper-bearing IUDs. The group, the guideline development group focused on the hazard ratio as presented here of 1.18 and the fact that the 96% confidence intervals also included unity, indicating a non-significant difference. This evidence was also considered to be of high quality. And lastly, the comparison of northeastern enantate compared with non-hormonal contraception or no method. Actually, the ECHO study did not address this particular method. So for this, this um, assessment of the quality, we're looking at cohort studies. One additional cohort study was published since the 2007 guidance. It's included in this table here. The quality of the evidence remains low, and the pooled adjusted hazard ratio, the estimate of FAC across these six cohort studies was 1.14, and the 95% confidence interval includes unity. So this also indicates a non-significant result, and, um, and the, um, the, uh, this table has been updated accordingly. Next slide, please. This grade table presents the evidence for the copper-bearing IUD. Again, similarly, the guideline development group focused on the point estimates that were presented in the Lancet paper of the primary results of the ECHO trial. Thus, for the comparison of IUD use compared with DMPA, the evidence comes from a randomized controlled trial of high quality with an estimate of effect of 1.04, the 96% confidence interval, including unity, indicating a non-significant result. Additionally, from the ECHO trial, the comparison of IUD use compared with implant, the risk of um, 
HIV using this method was indicated by a hazard ratio of 1.18. The 96% confidence interval includes unity, indicating that the any increase increased risk of IUD use compared with implant use was non-significant. And you can see here that this, as similarly, this uh, the quality of the data, uh, the evidence is considered of high quality. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, Another aspect of our the guideline development group's um, deliberations were various presentations on contraceptive values and preferences among women. And this, for next slide, please. So as part of this process, um, a systematic review of qualitative and quantitative studies was um, updated. 375 studies were included in this global review. And you can see from this map where, where countries are presented in blue uh, that there are that there was great representation of, um, of evidence coming from many different countries. And you can see on the panel here the number of studies from each WHO region. Next slide. This Systematic review found reports that, in general, women who are using contraceptive, they prioritize, they want contracept, they want a range of uh, the ability to have a range of methods from which to choose. They prefer methods that are effective, easy to use, and have few side effects. They also want to have control. They want to be the deciders on what method they actually choose but do appreciate advice from healthcare providers. And also they want to have access to comprehensive information about the methods themselves and the side effects. However, we did in this review, we did find that there's a wide variety of variability um, of these values and preferences within and across studies and that Oftentimes, it's the context and also what options that are available that actually shape what values and preferences women report. Next slide, please. We recognize, though, that despite there being a large literature of values and preferences of women who um, are using contraception, Oftentimes, there's a dearth when it comes to populations that are at high risk of HIV. So we undertook several different engagements with sex workers to find out more information about what they felt was important um, with regards to contraception and at the same time, risk of HIV. And what we, um, we conducted uh, a global survey we had approximately 236 respondents from around the world, and they, if among their top key um, priorities and the qualities that are most important to them when they select a method, they actually mirrors very much what was reported in the published literature. Sex, according to this survey, sex workers are keen, they prioritize effective, methods that prevent pregnancy, but they also um, seek methods that uh, protect against HIV and STIs. They want methods that have minimal side effects that are easy to access and also easy to use. And also they reported in this survey that there were actually for service delivery, although that's not the focus of this guideline, they did highlight that oftentimes sex workers face discrimination and stigma in healthcare settings. They um, would really like the global community to put greater investments into contraceptive counts, uh, education. They will also want to, um, pr they suggest that there would be a promotion of community engagement models, that uh, prevention and counseling services be integrated, and that um, there, there was a great deal of diversity as well as um, in the community. Next slide, please. 
In addition to the global online survey, we also conducted a qualitative study with uh, colleagues from the Sisters Project in Zimbabwe. In this qualitative study, six focus groups were uh, convened among sex workers in rural and urban areas of the country. They were first given role play scenarios, and then a focus group discussion took place to elicit their views. They reported that cost, accessibility, and side effects, and actually the care that they received, the treatment from healthcare providers, deeply influenced their use and uptake of contraception. They reported frequent condomless le condomless sex, and they also said that their male partners or clients also had a, a great influence on whether they were able to use contraception or not. Next slide, please. And lastly, we also heard from key stakeholders representing advocacy groups, uh, and they said that guidelines, WHO guidelines, work for women when they reflect their concerns, which are diverse and, and are uh, variable. And they also importantly noted that for some women, any level of HIV risk, HIV risk is too great. And that the ECHOS trial did not say that there is no HIV risk. They also told us that women, they, they've collected stories of women's lives and that they, they say that the choice of contraception, despite um, what we might think, is really a myth for many women. And lastly, they urged us that any changes to a WHO guideline on this topic should reflect clear and straightforward terms um, in the uh, documentation. Next slide, please. And then lastly, a presentation reviewing potential biological mechanisms, biological data was presented to the group. And uh, in, this, in this presentation, multiple, it was noted that there are multiple biological methods, mechanisms that could theoretically modify a person's risk of HIV acquisition. However, as data accumulates, it still remains unclear which of the mechanisms, the architecture, the um, uh, bio, uh, the flora of the uh, biome, et cetera. It's really unclear what is clinically relevant. And the uh, presentation really noted that it, the, any biological mechanisms may likely be multifactorial. There also is an acknowledgement that depending upon the hormone or progestogen in, in question, the concentration of that con of that hormone in a method and the actual mode of administration of a contraceptive method may actually um, contribute to the variability of whether uh, what, uh, the biological mechanisms. And lastly, it was noted that uh, while there are data from animal laboratory studies, the actual um, generalizability of these uh, data to clinical outcomes in humans remains uncertain. Next slide, please. So following these uh, presentations and much deliberation, the guideline development group then um, applied the evidence to decision-making framework to arrive at revised recommendations. Next slide, please. So this slide starts, is, um, this is the first of two slides that presents the evidence to decision table. And so as we noticed in the earlier slides from the grade table, the quality of evidence for progestogen only methods and IUDs was considered to be of high quality for DMPA and levonorgestrel implants and for the copper IUD. Now for other methods, there was varying quality. For the balance of benefits of harms, our guideline, de guideline development group strongly 
reiterated that contraception is a life-saving intervention with well-recognized health, social, and economic benefits. And they also noted that all progesterone-only contraceptives and IUDs are highly effective reversible methods. We also, they also noted that while there was no evidence on the subcutaneous DMPA or the etanogestural implants, that indirect evidence from the ECHO trial could be applied to these methods because the presentation on biological mechanisms, um, did, there isn't a reason to believe that there would be a differential risk in HIV. And also for levonorgestrel IUDs, the recommendation should be extrapolated from evidence on copper-bearing IUDs and other levonorgestrel containing implants, meaning, for example, the levonorgestrel um, the levonorgestrel implant. So the group judged that the balance of contraceptive use is is in favor of um, favors favors um, contraceptive methods. Next slide, please. We then considered values and preferences, and um, following on what we heard from the community, what we heard from the uh, engagements with sex workers and from the systematic review on values and preferences and WHO's human rights guideline that the, the group judge that there's a support to optimize informed contraceptive choice and the availability of a wide range of contraception, contraceptive options for women. Um, the group wholeheartedly agreed that effective that this is uh, that this is a problem that should be, receive priority that effective contraception and HIV prevention are both public health priorities. And also that for when it comes to equity and human rights, that the human rights guideline um, provides recommendations that are paramount principles for decision-making on, on this topic. So uh, principles such as non-discrimination, av ensuring availability, accessibility, acceptability, quality of services, um, prioritizing informed decision-making, privacy and confidentiality, participation, participation and accountability. These are all domains that um, are important when it comes to contraception. And lastly, the group argued that any guidance from WHO, there needs, it needs to be clear and women-centered for successful implementation. Next slide, please. So as a result, WHO now recommends for progesterone-only contraception that progesterone-only pills, DMPA net end injectables, and the levonorgestrel implants should all be classified as category one. That the evidence from one randomized controlled trial observed no statistically significant differences in HIV acquisition in the comparisons that we saw in the grade table. Next slide, please. Additionally, based on the grade tables and the evidence to decision making, uh, the evidence to decision tables, WHO now recommends for IUDs, both copper and levonorgestrel, that for women at high risk of HIV, they should be classified as category one conditions. The group did though add a clarification with these recommendations and these two methods. They acknowledged that as was seen in the ECHO trial results, many women at high risk of HIV are also at high risk of other STIs. And for these women that are at that uh, they should be review uh, providers and policymakers should refer to the women uh, on, that are at high increased risk of STIs, and they should also look at the WHO's selective practice recommendations for contraceptive use, particularly for STI screening before IUD insertion. And then the evidence statement here um, provides the support of how these the uh, the group arrived at its decision. Next slide, please. 
For policies, programs, and providers, the implications for this new guidance are that a woman's risk of HIV should not restrict her contraceptive choice. Next. We also acknowledge that efforts to expand access to contraceptive options must continue, must be prioritized. We also have seen, particularly from the ECHO trial, that there needs to be a renewed emphasis on HIV STI testing service in family planning settings, and that an integration of family planning and HIV prevention services is essential in high prevalence areas. In low prevalence settings, HIV testing and prevention services can be offered to women who request them. Next slide. So in conclusion, WHO has updated its guidance for women at high risk of HIV, there are now no medical restrictions for any contraceptive method. So women at high risk of HIV are medically eligible to use all progestogen-only contraceptives, all IUDs, and all combined hormonal contraceptives. The link here will, will be live tomorrow, and you can access the full document at that, uh, at that location. Next slide, please. And as we move to the digital age, we have also accordingly updated our MEC app. This will be available as well tomorrow at the website on this slide. We have now updated the recommendations for women at high risk of HIV, so we encourage you to share this resource with providers for decision support use. And now I pass back to Ian and James. Thank you very much indeed, Marilyn, for a very clear presentation. Um, let's move on to hear from James, uh, who's going to talk a bit about um, some of the thinking and the plans about how to support countries to, uh, to actually implement the revised guideline. Uh, so James, please, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ian, and I think my work is easy uh, following uh, Marilyn's uh, presentation, which clearly has shown what is the new uh, guidance. So on the next slide, I would just like to highlight that now we have the new global guideline, and uh, what remains is really the most probably the more difficult part of translating this into policies standards and practices at a national level. And I think it is encouraging that we have about uh, several countries, about 10 countries represented on the call today, that uh, this will be a very important uh, process. I'll go through the process of uh, implementation, uh, which is divided, which I've divided into these four categories. But as we know that this is a continuous uh, process, we'll talk about dissemination, then we'll talk about revision of national policies and standards and changing practices, which in WHO we refer to as really the implementing of the guidelines, and then the, the issue of monitoring and documentation. So on the next slide, uh, as we have said, uh, there's a process of launching the guidelines, and uh, we have the webinars that we are having now on, embargoed, uh, on the embargoed guidance. We hope that uh, you'll now be able to prepare for potential questions that you may get from various uh, stakeholders and that moving forward we'll have aligned uh, messages. And then as has been said tomorrow, next slide, next uh, click again. Tomorrow we'll have the launch of the guidance. Uh, the guideline will become available on the WHO website. We'll have a press release, a web story, and we'll also be disseminating it through social uh, media. So next slide. So in terms of uh, dissemination, uh, we have uh, we are planning several webinars uh, that will be open to all participants uh, to update them on the guidance, and we are planning several English uh, webinars uh, starting in uh, early to mid uh, September. 
And then in October, we anticipate we'll have both the French and Spanish uh, translations of the guidance uh, available. And that time we'll have uh, webinars in uh, French and uh, in Spanish. We have also several presentations uh, that are planned. Uh, I think uh, very soon on the on the 3rd of September, we will have a presentation at the regional aid team for East and Southern Africa, where we hope to present these uh, revised uh, guidelines. We'll also have a presentation at the IBP partners uh, meeting, uh, which is planned on 11th of uh, September. And then we'll have uh, the DMPA access collaborative meeting that is planned in late October, ICPD plus 25 in November and uh, at ICASA. But very importantly, these are the presentations that we have planned from here as the uh, colleagues will be sharing these slides as has been said, and it will be important for you also to arrange for dissemination activities uh, in the countries and uh, to make uh, these uh, presentations to the people in country so that we can start creating awareness and planning for implementation. So next slide. So in terms of uh, really moving forward to ensuring that these revised guidance get uh, implemented, we are planning a virtual training that uh, will include the WHO national professional officers and the task team members in the countries. Uh, this is uh, planned uh, in mid-September. Uh, so it will be an opportunity to have more training and in-depth uh, look at the guidelines and how one can move them to in-country policies and standards and to practices. In ICPD, we are planning a pre-conference training uh, workshop, uh, which will be sending out uh, invitations. And of course, all these uh, trainings, it will be important to follow up uh, with follow-up coaching and uh, mentoring. Uh, fortunately for us, we have uh, this document that is available which is the implementation guide for medical eligibility criteria for contraceptive use. So this is actually a guide that we have helped, that helps you to implement uh, the guidelines. And it will be very important uh, to support the task teams in the country as they revise the national standards, as they revise the tools, and also as they monitor and ensure that practices are changed uh, in terms of provision of uh, services. So on the next slide, uh, when we look at this uh, implementation guide, it actually is a package that contains both the implementation guide and also an implementation uh, toolkit. And I will go through the contents uh, of this uh, package in the next uh, three or so slides. So on the next slide, the guide itself, uh, which is available at the WHO website that is shown uh, there, before, there below, uh, highlights the recommended process for integrating WHO, MEC, and SPR, and also has resources for additional support in the adaptation uh, process. And on the next slide, the process is uh, divided into four stages. Although we know that these are not like standalone stages, it's uh, a continuous uh, process. We have the exploration uh, phase, and this at this stage we are looking at mapping uh, what is actually the current status of uh, guidelines, of standards, and of tools, and what is the status of their use. And if we are thinking, for the example, for this guidance, uh, which is now calling that there should be no restriction uh, for family planning method based on HIV uh, infection risk. It is calling for uh, provision of uh, prevention of HIV and STI in family planning services, and is also calling for expansion of method mix. These are the things we need to, in the exploration stage, to map and look at the status of the use of these uh, policies. This is followed by the installation phase, uh, which has the actual revision 
of the of the national policies and standards and uh, tools and then initial implementation is where we roll out the revised uh, guidelines and then full implementation is when we look at fully implementing so that the use of these revised standards, uh, tools, and guidelines actually results in change uh, practices uh, in the country. Each of these uh, in the guide is, has the goals for each stage and outlines the activities that you need to carry out in each stage. Then on the next slide. So the implementation guide uh, toolkit has several resources. Uh, for the four stages of implementation, including templates and guides and tools and some examples of successful uh, implementation. And is also available at the website uh, highlighted uh, there below. So on the next slide, uh, here I will not go through uh, the resources that are available, but as you can see, for each stage, we have several resources that you can be able to use. And uh, this we hope that will be much uh, very useful. And when we do the training programs, we'll go into more detail as to how you use each of these uh, resources. But there are many more, but I've just highlighted some of them that you can use at each uh, stage. So next slide. So in summary, uh, I would like to say that uh, where we are now, we have the global guidance that is now available. I think we need to be ready for the challenge, which is to translate it into national policies, into national standards, and to eventually have changed uh, practices uh, in the country that respond to this uh, new guidance. The implementation guide for the MEC and the SPR that I've gone through will be a key resource that will help us go through uh, this uh, process. And as WHO will be ready uh, to support you go through the process in each of your countries as you do uh, this. However, it's very important for us to leverage the task teams and various uh, structures that are available in the countries uh, in terms of transforming them uh, from just task teams that were set up to prepare for the results, to prepare for the guidance, into actually implementation teams that now lead this process of getting these guidelines uh, implemented. And it's important for us, of course, to have continued engagement of all st stakeholders so that we amplify our efforts. And at this stage, I would really like to recognize uh, our colleagues uh, from UNFPA that are on this call uh, from uh, various uh, countries, from Zambia, India, from Namibia, and um, probably other countries that have not uh, noted that uh, it will be very important for us to work together as uh, stakeholders and to amplify this dissemination and implementation uh, efforts. So I would like to stop there on the next slide just to say uh, thank you very much and uh, we are looking forward to continuing to work together thank you thank you very much indeed james and uh, for a, a nice continuation from the presentation from mary lynn uh, we have uh, five minutes left in the webinar i haven't seen any questions or um, or comments from anyone um, but you know, if we, we do have five minutes, so if someone does have uh, a, a question for either Marilyn or James, then uh, please send it through on the in the chat box on the right hand side of the screen. Um, we can keep that open for another minute or two. Um, but otherwise, um, please remember. Um, I think the, you know, the information provided was was very clear and, and, and concise. And um, please remember that uh, we will be formally uh, releasing the uh, updated guidance uh, tomorrow at 12 o'clock uh, Geneva time. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, the, this information is, is, is embargoed. Um, so if there are any questions, um, then please let us know. Otherwise, you can follow up with uh, James and Marilyn afterwards. Um, 
but yeah, thank you. Okay, we have one question. Uh, what's the import of the new guidance in countries with low prevalence of HIV who have no considerations for HIV risk for choice of contraceptives? Uh, James or Marilyn, does one of you would like to respond to that question? Well, um, thank you, thank you, Ian, and thank you for this for this question. Indeed, that is a, a question we understand quite a few countries may be asking, and that it, indeed for low for low um, incidence countries, they uh, first of all. There, there should be no restrictions uh, on the use of progesterone-only combined or interuterine devices. And for women who, in these settings, who do um, self-assess themselves to be at high risk, then they, they can use these methods and that they should be offered HIV and STI prevention services. So um, it's it's really incumbent upon all settings. The the MEC is a global guideline. So in essence, what we are urging, as James was mentioning, what we we urge everyone to do is to take these recommendations into consideration and look at your setting and see how they apply. Using the and you can use the implementation tools that James has just presented to consider whether how your program may or may not need to change. But currently, a risk of HIV, a high risk of HIV, should not be a contraindication for any contraceptive method. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn, for that uh, response. And uh, I would like to like echo the same. However, what is very important is that uh, this guidance, of course, women's uh, choice of contraception should not be restricted based on HIV infection uh, risk. So this will apply both into countries with high incidence of HIV and countries with low incidence of HIV. Uh, importantly, is that uh, the guideline calls for greater uh, efforts in uh, HIV prevention within family planning and also uh, prevention of STIs. And therefore, uh, the issue of STI prevention may be important in some countries that have uh, low incidence of uh, low incidence of HIV uh, infection. And also importantly is that we know that the countries are not uniform. So even within countries that have low HIV incidence, uh, there are probably certain populations uh, for which this issue may be uh, important. So that for those uh, specific populations, it would be important to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marilyn and James. Uh, I don't see any further questions. So once again, to thank you to everyone for participating and to our presenters. And I think we can uh, close the webinar now. So thank you, everyone. Oh, sorry, wait a minute, sorry. <laughs> we have a quick question. Um, thank you for the clear guidance and nice presentation. My question is, are you high risk high HIV risk category on the MEC wheel, in addition to increasing risk of STI, from the ECHO study finding both HIV and other STI risk was high. So, um, yeah, yes. James, would you like to respond to that question? Yeah, so I think from the ECHO study, what we found, was, what was found, was <laughs> that the women that participated had high risk of uh, STI, and uh, also of uh, HIV. Uh, the recommendation from this uh, guidance is that based on HIV infection risk, no method, access to no method, no method should have restricted access. But it's very important to recognize that many times the women at high risk of HIV are also at high risk of STI. And there's guidance uh, regarding the use of 
methods, particularly intrauterine devices for women at high risk uh, for STIs. And that should be referred to in making the decisions as to whether to initiate, continue uh, uh, the, the methods uh, for women at high risk of STI. Thank you, James, and thank you for that second question. Uh, if there's no other questions, then uh, thank you again, and uh, we'll close the uh, webinar at this point. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy the thank rest you. of your day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.